Welcome back to What Happens Next, the podcast that examines some of the biggest challenges facing our world and asks the experts, what will happen if we don't change? And what can we do to create a better future? I'm Dr. Susan Carland. Keep listening to find out what happens next. NFTs are an interesting use of crypto technology and could enable artists to make a living from their work. But they could also be, well, kind of silly. Do they work? Are they here to stay? Are NFTs as nifty as they seem? Stay with us over the next two episodes of What Happens Next as we take a look at NFTs. So firstly, and don't laugh at me tech heads, what the hell is an NFT? Oh, oh boy. How long is this podcast? This is going to be a challenge, but I'll try. Yeah, it um, it's, exists in this world we can't touch and we can't see. Uh, the short answer is it's a non-fungible token. Non-fungible, hey? Hmm. When we say it's non-fungible, it's got a, an identification number that's unique to that token. Okay, so NFT stands for non-fungible token. Non-fungible means it can't be replaced, but that sounds odd because an NFT is usually an artwork in the form of a digital file like a JPEG or video, which can obviously be duplicated, copied and shared over and over again. However, and if I'm following this right, what makes an NFT unique is that every NFT artwork has its own code. Uh, Can someone please just give me a simple definition? Okay. It's a, um, it's a digital receipt. A digital receipt. A digital receipt. There we go. That was easy. Attached to a, attached to a blockchain, which is um, a bit of an order. Ah, okay. So an NFT is a unique token that is attached to the blockchain. You know the blockchain. It's like a shared database of transactions on the... Okay, how about I get art lawyer Alana Kushnir to explain? Well, the first question really is what is blockchain? I think whenever Mm -hmm. you're trying to understand what an NFT is, you have to start with this question of what is blockchain? So blockchain is a type of a technology uh, which is a distributed ledger uh, where transactions are recorded and the idea is they're immutable in that they can never be hacked Mm -hmm. or changed. They can only be built on top of. It's written in stone. It's written in stone. So part of the value of NFTs comes with this immutability that the blockchain gives NFTs. So tokens essentially live on the blockchain. Tokens represent the transactions that um, are recorded on the blockchain. And some of those are fungible. Some of those are non-fungible. And fungible tokens are, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, they're your cryptocurrencies. And the idea is if I had one Bitcoin and you had one Bitcoin, if we exchanged those, we would end up with the same amount. Whereas a non-fungible token is slightly different. So it's kind of like if I bought a Picasso and you bought a Rembrandt and we exchanged those paintings, uh, we wouldn't end up with the same thing that we started off with. So they're non-fungible. So the idea is the token is unique. And that's also where part of the value of non-fungible tokens lies because they are unique on the blockchain. We can tell that there's only one of that type. So if I'm an artist, how do I create one of these tokens? How do I make an NFT? I need to speak to a digital artist. Hi, I'm John McCormack. I'm a computer artist and computer scientist, and I'm the director of Sensi Lab, a creative technologies lab at Monash University's Caulfield campus. Right, I want to create an NFT for this painting that I've created. How, how do I do that? How do I make an NFT for that? So usually you do it via one of the many sites that are um, that deal in cryptocurrencies and NFTs. Um, so you basically go onto the site. You have to have a digital asset usually associated with your work, although people have associated NFTs with physical paintings or physical art objects as well. Um, and then basically you, you pay what's called a gas fee, which is a fee to generate some unique token, which is the NFT itself. And you get given that NFT uh, digitally, and then someone can uh, buy that NFT from you and transfer ownership from you to the person who who buys it. Okay, so if I'm an artist, I can turn an artwork into an NFT and sell it. However, if I'm buying an NFT, 
What do I actually own? Hi, my name's Ben Haywood. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Business Law and Taxation at the Monash Business School, and my research work looks at how the law can support international trade in various forms in particular. So you don't really own that artwork in the same way that you might own a physical painting. What you own is the token and it's linked to some extra right. You can actually think of it like, I don't know, buying a bottle of water from a vending machine or, um, you know, buying a cup of coffee. When you buy that bottle of water or a coffee, you own that property. You can enjoy it to the exclusion of anybody else. That's the kind of, that's the fundamental principle of personal property. It's something that you can possess and you can possess it to the exclusion of anyone else. So take that in the context of a painting or a sculpture. You buy your painting, you buy a sculpture, you can display it in your house. You can loan it to somebody. You know, you could loan it to a museum for an exhibition. You could sell it as well. Um, So that's your kind of traditional artwork. Um, But, you know, when it comes to digital artwork, it's a little bit different and that's because it's so easy to reproduce, Mm. right? So you don't necessarily, um, you know, if I send it to you via email, you know, a digital file, we could both enjoy it at the same time. You could look at the image, the digital file, and I could look at it on, you know, we could be on complete other sides of the world and we can both enjoy it um, as it's meant to be enjoyed. Mm. So in that way, a, a digital artwork has some fundamental differences to a painting or a sculpture. Um, and, you know, if we look at the history of art and especially, you know, late modern art and contemporary art, a lot of artists were um, driven by this idea of um, wanting to um, – question this idea of what is an original artwork, what is an authentic artwork, the idea that there's no, you know, in today's world, there's no such thing as the one authentic piece. Um, You know, think of like performance art, for example, that's also intangible. So, you know, in some ways I also think digital artworks, NFTs, they're not so new. Artists have really been pushing the boundaries when it comes to what is art Mm. and what you buy when you buy an artwork for far longer than NFTs have existed. Uh, What NFTs do, though, is, um, you know, from a very practical level, they do tell us who owns that NFT, who owns that digital artwork. So that's the, that's the, the basic benefit of minting your digital artwork as an NFT. So... Why are people so excited about NFTs? Here's Ben Haywood. I think people get excited about anything that's new. People got excited about the Beatles and Elvis when they hit the scene. <laughs> and I wonder if it's really much different, much different to that. Um, I think it's it's a way for us to explore new types of trade. Mm. And, you know, in the future, this may be something that persists, we might end up using NFTs for different purposes. It's a bit hard to know at this stage, but they give us an opportunity to do something we've never really done before. And I guess for the purpose of trading art where previously you have a digital file that represents some artwork, it's infinitely reproducible, meaning its value is basically nothing, not really a very attractive prospect for trading those kinds of Um, artworks online and this is a way to maybe deal with that, make online artwork unique and allow it to have um, a tradable value and possibly support artists at the same time. Do you think NFTs are beneficial for artists? Um, They could be in the sense that I don't know that there was really an effective way to trade digital art before this technology. Um, I guess artists are going to want to make sure that the contracts they have in place around the trade in these NFTs are beneficial to them, whether that means retaining the intellectual property rights, making sure they're properly uh, paid for the work they're producing. But I guess, as we've said, if you've got an ordinary file, infinitely reproducible, so effectively worth nothing, um, this situation has some definite advantages over that. Personally, I have a lot of reservations, so I've never really used them. Here's director of Sensi Lab, John McCormack. I've, I've sort of dabbled a little bit, but I, you know, I didn't really get in when it was when I probably could have. I probably wouldn't be talking to you now, or you'd be talking to me from my multi-million dollar <laughs> apartment somewhere, in, <laughs> wherever, um, if I had. But um, I'm not sure. I mean, I do appreciate the fact that there were a lot of people who had menial jobs who wanted to be artists who suddenly could could live that that possibility. I mean, being an artist and earning money are two things that normally don't go together. And if you look at, even in Australia, the average income of people who professionally say they're artists is amongst the lowest um, of any profession. So I certainly don't want to deny people 
the, you know, if, if a technical mechanism enables somebody to earn a living from something that is, is creative and gives them enjoyment and pleasure and gives other people enjoyment, then I th- think that's a fantastic thing. But also, you know, cryptocurrencies ultimately are kind of Ponzi schemes. They're basically, they rely on a whole lot of collective herd mentality about the value of something that doesn't really actually have that value. Uh, NFT proponents might say that um, it helps protect from fraud and theft because you've got this you know, untraceable digital receipt that's forever linked to a particular artwork. But that's, yeah, that doesn't, to my mind, that doesn't hold up to scrutiny at all. Josh Drummond is an artist from New Zealand and a very proud NFT cynic. One of the major problems when NFTs first got big was people would um, NFT fans or grifters or whatever um, would grab someone's JPEG that's floating around on the internet, like a like a named artist or someone someone with a following. They'd take their work and just sell it. Mm. They'd make an NFT of it and sell someone else's stuff. That's that's just that's just stealing. Yeah. And it facilitated tons of the stuff. And none of the NFT marketplaces originally, and I still don't really think currently had super robust systems in place to protect against this. So they didn't really facilitate. Um, and viability, they actually just made art a lot easier to steal. I'm not going to lie, this is a big problem at the moment and I'm finding that a lot of artists that I work with are finding copycat NFTs of their works online and they ask the same question, well, what do I do? What can I do at this point in time? Most mainstream NFT platforms have set out what we call a DMCA takedown notification process. And that's essentially an American style of requesting that you take down infringing content. And you have to follow the strict guidelines that the platform sets out in order to do that. But, you know, even myself in practice, when I've acted for artists and we've done these takedown notices, it hasn't been that straightforward. Even a year ago, I would say, you know, a lot of the mainstream platforms perhaps didn't get as much legal advice as they have at this point in time. And so those processes that are set up weren't that straightforward. They weren't easy for some, you know, for, for somebody who's not a lawyer to be able to navigate and do. They are getting easier. Um, but, you know, there's there's been lots of instances in which artists have tried to get their content taken down. They haven't had the result that they wanted. Um, Some of them have gone out on social media, vented about it on social media, and unfortunately or fortunately that's when the platforms have acted. Unless you can afford or know you've got a friend who's a copyright lawyer who can afford to um, fling out um, DMCA notices all day. And I mean, it's it's a it's a lot of overhead. With it. even if you, even if you are wealthy, it's um it's it'll be pretty hard to keep up with. So, yeah, that's um I think the sort of promise of um of theft, you know, of a eternal receipt or whatever. I, th- I really think it's it's kind of overblown. The main interest for me was whether seeing artists could kind of hitch their um hitch their their artwork to this trendy new bandwagon and um and make a killing off it. And some definitely did like. Yeah, people is the the mm. obvious use case who is now richer than God. Before NFTs were a thing, the digital artist known as Beeple, Mike Winkleman to his friends, hadn't sold a print for anything over a hundred dollars. However, since he turned some of his work into NFTs, he's made some serious money. How serious? Well, one of his NFTs, a collage of his work, sold at auction for almost $90 million. Yep, $90 million. So for that price, the buyer of Beeple's work gets a digital file and the artist himself, as Josh Drummond just said, becomes richer than God. But is the artwork any good? Or is this just a fundamental, never-ending question we seem to ask every time something new happens in the art world? If you look at the famous NFT works like the Beeple work, I don't know if you know about this work, but Beeple was an artist who, he was well-known but not super well-known, um, and, and, you know, he famously auctioned off this work that sold for its millions and millions of dollars, huge amounts of money, massive amounts of money. But anyone can have a copy of that work, the same copy that the person who paid all that money has. There's no difference. So I have the full resolution image. Is it great art? It doesn't, it, not, to me, it's not, um, it's not worth anywhere near the amount of money that was paid for if you compare it to actual works that you think throughout history have, have sort of earned a reputation as being significant human works of art. This is not in that 
league, in my opinion. Um, so there is this this tainted aspect that this has that I, and I think it's sort of typical of the tech world at the moment when, you know, as soon as something, there's a scheme to make money, this sort of innate human greed takes over and, it, and art just seems to be the vehicle that provided that money-making mechanism and it was largely peripheral. I suppose in the end, people will buy whatever art they like, whether it's good or rubbish or, you know, if you look at it as a talented artist and go, that's a piece of crap. But I might go, oh, but it's lovely. Like that's always existed, hasn't it? Like, you know, people without much. Yeah, Yeah, I'm not I You know, so I've thought about this quite a lot and I wrote an essay recently about it and I think it's more complicated than that. I think a lot of it was to do with, um, because there's money involved and eye-watering amounts of money in some cases, I think people lost sight of the fact that it might just have artistic value for its own sake and looked at it more as a kind of investment thing. I think it's also the kind of fear of missing out. Like if, if all of your friends are saying, I bought an NFT, I own this, you know, look, look at what I bought for $20,000. You think I've got to get into that too. I don't, I don't want to be left out. And so issues of aesthetics or taste or meaning or, you know, any of those things that you might traditionally think of as being qualities that you might cause you to like it or or not, kind of thrown out the window. You know, that's the power of ownership is really important because that's the only thing that NFTs really did. They didn't change the art itself. I mean, people were always making digital art. They just had this weird way of saying you own this in some very nebulous unlegally verifiable sense of mm. Mm. That's really interesting. I wonder if it tapped into this part of the human psyche, uh, you know, this very animalistic part of human psyche, which is I want the rare thing. Mm. I want the thing that other people can't have um, yeah. because it makes it valuable. And yeah. so NFTs were putting something that's very rare in the hands of everyday. Most of us can't, will never be in a position to buy the $5 million one-of-a-kind sports car or, mm. you know, the Picasso. But NFTs were saying, actually, you, you can do this now. You can have a thing no one else can have and it will give you the bragging rights. And I wonder if there's a very human inclination to want those things. There's a whole lot of psychology around, you know, around conspicuous consumption and um, people, you know, why do, why do people have an art collection that they want to show off to show that they have wealth, power and status and so on. Um, and then there's sort of more probably more fundamental evolutionary biological reasons why you might want to do that too, um, just, to, just to sort of show the quality of, you know, genetically that you've, that you've managed to achieve this ability to buy something that no one else can, can have. Um, so I think there was a lot of it was that. A lot of it is also um, that you could own a Porsche if you traded in NFTs at the right time. So if you bought in low and sold high, you could basically take your crypto money that you paid for the NFT or that you received for it when you sold it onto someone else and turn that into real money and then actually be able to spend that real money on something. It turns out there are also environmental impacts associated with NFTs. Professor John McCormack explains. This, when NFTs first took off or, and, and cryptocurrency sort of became a mainstream thing, there was a lot of discussion about the environmental impact. So you were seeing, um, for example, large um, bit mining of Bitcoin mining um, factories, I guess you could call them, in, in China, for example, that were using coal-fired power plants to power their, their, their um, crypto mining that they were doing. And uh, so there was a reaction against this. It, it gets more complicated technically because there's two different kinds of crypto mining mechanisms, they're called. And one of them is far less environmentally damaging than the other. But the major platforms like Ethereum, Bitcoin still use the old method, which is environmentally quite, you know, I mean, also, you know, the, there's lots of industries that are environmentally bad in terms of their power consumption. But this just seems to be, an added thing that's purely largely for human folly. And the environmental impacts have been really high. And now that this, when the market drops out, it's also not just the, the power consumption, it's all the e-waste. So people were, this, this big shortage of, um, of computer chips partially arose because of this rise in crypto and NFT. So car, car, people were buying hundreds of thousands or hundreds of thousands of GPUs or CPUs, putting them in big racks, running them with from coal-fired power, for example, 
Um, and that caused a chip shortage that caused a whole lot of people that might be using these for other perhaps you might argue more um, well ethically interesting or ethically valid reasons were not able to access it because the crypto miners had bought them all up so I think there is this huge issue with it it still exists today um, Ethereum have said they're going to change to a more environmentally friendly scheme but they they haven't yet um, and you know, so and I think there were there was a lot of pressure on artists to to think carefully about the environmental impact of selling their work on NFTs. And so a lot of platforms arose that were supposedly green. I mean, any NFT or any computer system uses power. You can't get a walk around that. Um, so there is an additional cost in terms of the power consumption, and that's largely opaque to the user. Where does the where does the crypto get its power from, and who's doing the mining? And because it's all distributed it's very difficult to, to chase all that up. So has the bubble already burst on NFTs? I think a lot of interest, and, and again, I think this is due to the sort of, I hesitate to say the end of the pandemic, but at least a change in the way, you know, we're, we're no longer in lockdowns, we're no longer, you know, galleries are open again, you can go to museums, people are getting out. Digital works are great if you're sitting in front of a computer, but, it, you know, as you said, I mean, you can print them out and hang them on the wall if you want to, but, most of them, I think people might look back and say, really, I paid that much money for that? I'm glad I can finally get my head around what an NFT actually is. Are NFTs all that bad? Is there potential for artists to get paid and consumers to make a good investment? What does the future look like for NFTs? In our next episode, experts in the field of business and law discuss some of the ways they are helping both artists and consumers navigate the tricky legal world of NFTs. We'll also find out about the world's first self-proclaimed anti-NFT project. Thanks to all our guests, Dr. Ben Hayward, Professor John McCormack, Alana Kushnir, and Josh Drummond. For more information about their work, visit our show notes. If you're enjoying What Happens Next, don't forget to give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and share the show with your friends. Thanks for joining us. See you next week.